Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Today I want to continue with the study of the book of Galatians, a verse-by-verse -verse commentary. And today I'll pick up where I left off last time, uh, Galatians chapter 5, beginning with verse 6. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision but faith which worketh by love. So, whether someone gets circumcised or doesn't get circumcised, it doesn't matter. Unless a person is putting their faith in the circumcision, then it's a problem. It ruins um, the gift of salvation. Um, but uh, faith is the only thing that matters. Let's see that in the Amplified, verse 6. For if we are in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means nothing. No, it means anything. Uh, but only faith activated and expressed and working through love. Uh, well, which worketh by love, uh, in the Amplified says, uh, uh, activated and expressed and working through love. Um, okay, so the scripture says, it's, but, but faith work, which worketh by love. Um, well, of course, it's, it's only because God loves us. Uh, how many verses can we go to to demonstrate? Uh, here's a perfect one. Um, God demonstrated or, or commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish we hope you're beginning to understand that the motivation of all of this is love, the love God has for mankind. Uh, Jesus said uh, uh, there's no greater love than, than being willing to give your life for a friend. And that's what he did for us. He laid down his life so that we could have life everlasting. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. So, yes, this faith and this salvation is all activated because of love. The love of God to, to uh, give us this gift, offer us the gift. The love of God to be willing to suffer and pay for our sins in our place. And um, the natural reaction, the natural reaction. If a person understands this, and if they believe it, the natural reaction is, we love him because he first loved us. Or, we love him because we understand how much he loved us first. I know that's what happened to me. That's exactly what happened to me at my conversion. I'm reading the Gospel of John, and as soon as I understood how much Jesus loved me, I couldn't help but love him in return and desire him as my savior, God. And um, I, I wanted fellowship with him. Um, my motivation was not fear of, of hell. I, it's, it's not that I didn't believe in, in uh, hell and didn't believe in that the, the, uh, there's uh, the lost uh, go to hell. I did believe that. But foremost on my mind, the motivating factor for me to embrace Jesus and receive this gift of salvation was uh, I loved him and I, I wanted this relationship with him. So, verse 6, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. 
Verse 7, ye did run well, who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? Uh, so I guess he's saying that you Galatians, uh, you, you did run well, you, you were doing well for a while, but who hindered you that you should not obey the truth now that you're departing from the true gospel? Verse 7 in the Amplified says, you are running the race well. Who has interfered and prevented you from obeying the truth? We knew who it was. Do you know who it was now? I hope if you watch this whole series, you know who it was. It's, uh, it's, uh, roots go back to the Jerusalem church and, and what was taught in the be very, very beginnings of the church that, uh, salvation was only for Jews, not the rest of the world, only the Jews. And that, uh, you, you had to be a Jew, so you had to practice Judaism. Then you could believe in the Messiah, the Savior, Jesus. Um, so it was a combination of believing in practicing Judaism and believing in uh, Jesus is the, the promised Messiah. Uh, and that was a big mistake. It took, well, it's, it's never really gone away. The um, book of Acts tells us a 30-year history of this problem persisting. and uh, uh, But it, it still exists today. Uh, that's, that's probably 90, 95% of all professing Christians have this false gospel that uh, salvation is a combination of believing in Jesus and being religious. They don't call it practicing Judaism. Um, but it, in a lot of ways, some of them are trying to practice Judaism because they're trying to follow the Mosaic laws. The Ten Commandments are Mosaic laws. Um, it, it, uh, all all the, the other laws of Moses, most people are not trying to do that except for the most extreme. Um, uh, but uh, whether it's uh, the rules and regulations of Judaism or some other uh, man-made rules, uh, through religion, uh, when you when you divide your faith between Jesus and religion, you have nothing of value. Christ is of none effect to, to you. Uh, so the question he asks here is, who did hinder you? It was the Judaizers. Judaizers, uh, I think we can try, try trace that to Judaism, and we can trace it to Judea. Judea, of course, Jerusalem is in Judea. The Church of Jerusalem is in Judea. Uh, the Apostles are in Ju Judea. James is the leader of the church in Judea. So that's the answer to this question. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Verse 8. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. Let's see that in the Amplified. This deceptive persuasion is not from him who called you to freedom in Christ. Okay, so in other words, you, you didn't get this from, from Jesus. You, this is not from God. What you're believing now is not from God. It's uh, the, the teachings of men. Uh, and that's probably, oh, I think we have, let me see. How many? Roman Catholic cult is 1.2 billion people. 1.2 billion people believe that uh, uh, to be saved, you got to keep your fingers crossed first of all, because you can't know for sure, and you got to hope that you've done well enough. But you got to believe in Jesus. Uh, he's the son of God and he died for our sins and he rose from the dead. But that's not how you get saved if you're Roman Catholic. Uh, you don't put your faith in person and finished work of Christ. Instead, you put your faith in your ability to follow the traditions that are taught by popes throughout history. The traditions of men. Uh, the, the religious rules of Romanism. So we have 1.2% billion people, Roman Catholics, that are, are not saved because their faith is not entirely in Jesus. 
And then we probably have about, of all professing Christians who are not identified as Romanists, uh, the rest of them, probably 50 to 70 percent of them are also adding some works requirement uh, to get saved. So if you are someone who believes that salvation is a free gift by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and glory goes to Christ alone this way, and we get our truth from scriptures alone. If that's what you believe, you are in a tiny little segment, a little remnant of true believers, of true Christians. Um, verse 9, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. So a little leaven, uh, I think that's referring to false teachings, uh, heresies, uh, bad doctrine. Uh, in this case with salvation, it only takes a little speck. It takes like one little grain of leaven and the, and the whole lump of dough is, is ruined. It's not pure. It's adulterated, as I said in the last video. Uh, your faith must be 100% in Jesus. You must be one of these 100 percenters. I am relying 100% on Jesus for my salvation. I put no faith in my own ability, my own performance, my own righteousness, my own merit. Zero. If you are putting any faith in your ability to please God by the way you're living your life, whether it's following the, the uh, religious tenets like baptism, confession, communion, uh, church attendance, the golden rule, uh, whatever it is that you're adding to it, then you've ruined it. And you are not saved. And this is a dire warning to you. You need to repent. That means change your mind and leave that false gospel that you believe. It's not a gospel. It's not good news at all. Because you can't even say for sure you're going to go to heaven. you got to say, well, I think I'm going. I hope I'm going. I hope I've done well enough. Unless you understand that salvation is a free gift by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone then you cannot have the blessed assurance. You cannot have peace like a river, joy like a fountain. You cannot have that. You will always have doubts and fears and worries about your future. So you need to repent. That means change your mind, uh, reject the false way of faith plus works, and embrace and believe the gospel, that salvation is a free gift, Nothing's required on your part because Jesus did it all for you. Just receive the gift of eternal life through faith alone in Christ alone. Uh, let me read verse 9 in the Amplified. Um, a little leaven, a slight inclination to error, or a few false teachers, leavens the whole batch. It perverts the concept of faith and misleads the church. All right, that's a pretty good way of uh, phrasing, I guess. There's a footnote on 11. Let me see what the footnote says. It says, leaven, that's yeasty dough, represents the man-made tradition and false teachings that obscure the truth regarding salvation through personal belief and faith in Christ. Yes, so leaven is just... Uh, adding to the gospel and therefore ruining it, adding anything to it. Or there's, oh, all I'm saying is you got to get water baptized. What's wrong with that? Well, you've added a requirement and you've ruined the whole thing. Jesus fulfilled all, all that was required on your behalf. Don't spit in his face on the cross saying, Jesus, that wasn't good enough. I've got to get water baptized too. Of course, you should get water baptized, but you're not required to for salvation. After you get saved, then go get water baptized. It's a great way for you to go before the public and proclaim your faith to your friends and family and use the, the 
water baptism as a, as a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and the new birth in you as a new creature, a child of God. Verse 10 in the KJV, I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. Wow, that's that's a very confusing verse to me. Let me see the Amplified now phrases it. <clears throat> I have confidence in you in the Lord that you will adopt no other view contrary to mine on the matter. This is what Paul is telling the Galatians. But the one who is disturbing you, the Judaizers, the false teachers, whoever he is, will have to bear the penalty. Yeah, Jesus warned. He said that uh, the Pharisees, which is just another form of, of um, um, uh, you know, religious uh, uh, system as, as a means of earning salvation, the, the, the strict uh, practice of the Pharisees, uh, the only thing, the difference in the Pharisees, and some of the Pharisees put their faith in Jesus. Some of these people who are these false teachers here that we keep referring to, these are actually Pharisees because the scriptures say, that some of Pharisees were believers, but they were the ones that go on to say, well, yeah, we believe Jesus is the one. So we're in agreement, but you you better continue practicing all, all of Judaism and let's be in now by your circumcision. Uh, the, the next verse in the KJV, Uh, and I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. So I think Paul is saying, well, if I would just concede and preach circumcision and go along with the crowd, then the per my persecution against me would cease uh, and the, the, the cross would no longer be an offense. But you know, Paul preaches the cross is is what we need to remember, not circumcision. Uh, the cross is where our sins were paid for. Our belief that Jesus paid for our sins on the cross and He offers us eternal life as a free gift uh, that is the good news. And uh, this, um, let me see this verse eleven in the. Amplified. But as for me, brothers, if I am still preaching circumcision as I had done before I met Christ, and as some accuse me of doing now as necessary for salvation, wow, some people were accusing Paul of actually teaching circumcision is necessary for salvation. Well, that's the first time I've ever noticed that. Uh, of course, Paul was accused of and, and rightly so, of teaching that um, uh, stop practicing Judaism. Don't put any faith in Judaism, whether it's circumcision or any other aspect of Judaism. Don't put any faith in that. Just stop it entirely, uh, and especially don't believe that that will contribute to your salvation. That's what Paul was, was doing. But it says here, some accuse me of doing now, uh, which is... Uh, preaching circumcision as, as he had done before he met Christ. Wow, it's amazing. Paul is getting there from all sides, all these accusers. Uh, why am I still being persecuted by Jews? Let's go to the next verse in the KJV. Um, I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. Well, these Judaizers that are troubling the the, um, the saints in Galatia, um, he says he would like for them to be cut off or separated or shunned. Um, 
let's see verse 12 how amplified phrase it. I wish that those who are troubling you by teaching that circumcision is necessary for salvation would even go all the way and castrate themselves. Ah, wow. Okay. Okay, that's what it means by cut off. I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. Wow. Hmm, that's interesting. I wonder what how that appears in a, Let's just look at another translation. Let's just pick one here. Let me pick one that will irritate everybody here. Uh, let's look at the... Let's look at the New King James, see what, how that phrases it. Uh, that was verse uh, 12. Verse 12. The, if I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. Okay. Cut themselves off. Okay, so that's, that's kind of alluding to it. It's not stating it as clearly as the Amplified. Let me see how it's phrased in the, the Notorious. Uh, new International. New International Version. Let's see how they do it. Verse 12. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. So I think that uh, it is common for um, other translations to uh, take this verse 12 when in, in KJV when it says cut off, that they interpret that as uh, castration. Uh, why don't you go castrate yourself? If you believe in circumcision and you're trying to oppose on everybody, then they, why don't you just, I wish you'd just go castrate yourself, is what Paul's telling them. Uh, okay. Okay, so back to the 13 in the, in the uh, KJV. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for the occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. So this is what I talked, I think, about quite a bit in the last video, is this liberty, maybe the previous video too, uh, about the difference between the bond woman and the free woman, and the, the liberty uh, or the, the, uh, the, the bondage. Uh, being under the law is bondage. Uh, being in, in Christ is, is liberty. Yeah, we're free to sin, but uh, Paul says only use not, don't use your liberty, your freedom for an occasion to the flesh. Don't just use your liberty in that way. As I said in the last video, people who would do such a thing, uh, I don't know, I'm it's hard for me to imagine many people, I think only a tiny fraction of saved people would think in terms of, well, now that I'm free, I know I'm going to go to heaven no matter what. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and, and sin all I want now. And uh, let me, I, this is a good opportunity for me to do the sins that I've always wanted to do, but I was afraid I would go to hell. So now I can do all those other sins too. Now, people don't think like that. Uh, especially if they got the Holy Spirit transforming them, they don't think like that. Now, there there may be some, uh, a few individuals that, that have done that. I'm not ruling it out completely, but it's not the norm. It's not something to for people to automatically say, well, see, you're giving people a license to sin. Well, yeah, but they but we don't take advantage of it because that's not why we're, we're, we're Christians. We're not becoming Christians so that now oh, I can go sin all I want. What is, what is wrong with a person that even brings something like that up? I think you better go look in the mirror. Take a good look in the mirror because uh, there's so much hypocrisy, uh, spiritual pride, self-righteousness. That you know, they Just take a good look in the mirror and you'll see that. Because uh, you think that you're so good that you wouldn't do that. But all the other people who believe in salvation is a free gift, not by any works, that, oh, we're... 
we're just horrible people and we'll just use it as license to sin. But no, you would never do that. You wouldn't do it because uh, you, you're one of the really special people, the special Christians. That kind of self-righteousness, it just makes me, makes me absolutely sick. Um, let's see verse 13 in the Amplified. For you, my brothers, were called to freedom. Only do not let your freedom become an opportunity for the sinful nature, the worldliness, selfishness, but through uh, love, serve and seek the best for one another. That's the, the way a Christ's mind thinks. Verse 14 in the KJV, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Yes. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, love, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, Jesus condensed it into the two commandments, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Paul um, uh, emphasizes the second part, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And truly, if, if we love our neighbor, and that means that we're going to do good for our neighbor. We're not going to lie to our neighbor. We're not going to steal from them. We're not going to sleep with our neighbor's wives. We're not going to do the things that that um, uh, many people would do uh, if they did not have the Holy Spirit directing their their paths and uh, uh, transforming their desires. Uh, the, the the natural man does all those things. Uh, But when we, so love is really, uh, that's what Jesus and Paul here have just boiled it down to this one word, love. Uh, let's love God because he first loved us. He loved us so much, he would become a man and suffer and die on a cross for our sins. Uh, so we love him. Uh, what about our fellow man? Uh, let's love our neighbor, our fellow man as ourselves. Um, Let's not try to take advantage of him by cheating him. Uh, let's let's uh, go out of our way to do good for our fellow man. Verse 15 in the KJV, But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So walking in the Spirit just means that the Holy Spirit's living into you, living in you permanently. The Holy Spirit is talking to your conscience and your mind and trying to direct your your soul. So the Holy Spirit of God is directing your soul, which is your mind, your personality, your consciousness, your memories, your memories, your identity, your personhood. So uh, let the Holy Spirit direct your paths. Let the Holy Spirit transform you. Walk in the Spirit. And uh, I will tell you that the Holy Spirit has transformed me since December of 1986. If you knew me then and you knew me now, um, as some of my friends who have known me that long could testify, that uh, my interests my desires, my activities are 180 degrees different than they used to be. Uh, I don't need to do a confessional right now to tell you all the, the things that I've done that uh, uh, my past is, I'm, I'm sure I'm as guilty as anybody else. Um, but I don't struggle against those things anymore because I don't have the desires. The Holy Spirit has transformed my mind so that my desires and interests are different than they used to be. So I'm not even struggling thinking, oh, I really want to do all those things I used to do. That's, that's what happens when you uh, uh, submit your will over to the will of God. Uh, obviously, 
I, don't, I haven't done it completely. No, I don't know if anybody has done it completely. But as we do, more and more surrender our will over to the Holy Spirit and listen to the Spirit and allow it to do a work in us, transforming us, um, there will be some big changes. Verse 17, for the lust, for the, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. So there is a struggle, but over time, the spirit in you will get the victory if you cooperate. If you resist the spirit, and give in to the fleshly desires, uh, then this struggle can go on for your whole life. Uh, but the more that you uh, reject the cravings of the flesh and you embrace the uh, uh, teachings and the promptings of the Holy Spirit, then uh, you will not have to struggle. It will be easy. Verse 18, but if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. See? So all you've got to do is, is remember the, the royal law, which is love. Okay? Love God, love your fellow man, and you're going to do good. And as far as uh, listening to the, the flesh, the, the natural man, uh, the sinful nature, in us or listening to the Holy Spirit. Open up and listen to the Holy Spirit. Be receptive to it. And then you'll find that there's a, a story about a two dogs, a, a black dog and a white dog. And the, 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 you have to f feed, you feed one of these dogs. And if you feed one of them, the other one dies because it's not being fed. The black dog represents our evil desires. The white dog represents our righteousness and our, our, our righteous desires. Uh, so feed the white dog. And the, guess what? The black dog dies because you're not feeding it. Uh, how do you feed the Holy Spirit, that, the, the white dog in you? You, you um, pray. Paul says, continue instant in prayer. Continually pray. Uh, continue instant in prayer. I've always loved the way that was phrased uh, because it, to me it means that I, I'm not praying right now because I'm talking to you. Uh, if I'm reading the scriptures or I'm talking or I'm busy working, my mind is on a task that I'm focused on it. Uh, but as soon as my mind is freed, I should instantly continue in the prepare in the in the prayer. The prayer is just my conversations with, with Jesus, and uh, if we can train ourselves to instantly continue in prayer, uh, automatically when our mind is free, go to Jesus, talk to Jesus, have fellowship with Jesus, listen to the Holy Spirit. We're feeding the white dog, and the black dog begins to die. We, the same thing is can be done by reading the scriptures, studying the scriptures, having fellowship with other believers, keeping busy working for the Lord in some kind of ministerial works. All these things are ways that you will grow and mature uh, spiritually. So, but if you are led of the Spirit, you're not on the law. No, I don't have to think about the law. I don't have to think about a list of rules to follow. I just... Walk in the Spirit. Now, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idol idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they 
which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So, okay, someone could use this verse to say, see, you, you have to stop doing those things or you won't inherit the kingdom of God. But that is talking about a person that's not saved. A person who is not saved, all these things that they're doing here, uh, that's the reason that they can't are not being saved because of uh, sin. So, that, in fact, I could say that all these things here, that's the reason you need to get saved, because we're all guilty of those things. So, if once we get saved, then all those things are wiped away and washed away, and they're cast as far as the east is from the west, and uh, he will remember our sins and iniquities no more. So, this applies to everybody before they get saved. It's a list, quite a list. We could add more things to it if we wanted to. Uh, but the point is, uh, I think he's putting a lot of things there because it, uh, to make sure all the bases are covered so no one can say, well, see, no, I haven't, I haven't done anything on the list there. No, I'm sure we're all guilty of some things on the list. So that means you can't go to heaven. Well, what am I to do? I'm guilty. Well, put your faith in Jesus and receive his righteousness and uh, your, your sins are paid for and uh, you'll get to go to heaven because of Jesus. Verse uh, 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, which is another word for patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. There's no law against those things. These are good. And that's the fruit of the Spirit. That's what happens to a person's life when they uh, surrender their will over to the Holy Spirit that's living inside them. Now, you don't have to surrender uh, to get saved. This is another thing that you know we strenuously uh, um, argue against. People saying that if you want to be saved, you have to Surrender your life over Jesus and turn your will completely over to Jesus. No, you don't have to do that. You just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, put your faith completely in him. Then the Holy Spirit comes in you. Once the Holy Spirit lives in you, now the question is, are you going to listen to the Spirit? If you will surrender and say, I want this, you, Holy Spirit, I want you to direct my path. I want you to transform me. If you embrace that, then the fruits are these virtues. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That's what happens when a person does surrender their will over the Holy Spirit. But we don't do that in order to get saved. After we get saved, we have the ability to do that. Will you? That's the question. Or will you hold on to your will and say, I'm not going to let God guide my life. I still want to be in charge. Well, if you want to be in charge, fine, but you're going to have this battle between the spirit and the flesh, and the struggle and the frustration. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Let me read those last few verses in the Amplified. Let me see. Verse 22, I'll start there. But the fruit of the Spirit, the result of His presence within us, is love, that is unselfish concern for others. Joy, that's inner peace. Uh, patience, uh, not the ability to wait, but how we act while waiting. Oh, that's very, very good. I hadn't thought of it that way. It's not the ability to wait and just be patient, but how we're acting. Yes. Uh, yeah, how we act while we're waiting says a lot about us, doesn't it? Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Wouldn't you like 
people to use those words to describe you? How would you feel if, if, if there's a, some kind of a test that I took many years ago and uh, you, you send it to, let's say, five or ten people who know you and they have to choose certain words to describe you and the words that come up the most often is that you get to see how people perceive you. And what if we asked everybody to give me five adjectives to describe you? All your friends, all your family, everybody who knows you very well, give me five adjectives to describe you. Wouldn't you like to have these virtues? Wouldn't you love for people to think of you in that way, see you in that way? Because that's the real you. Gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. There's no law against these virtues. And those who belong to Christ uh, have crucified the sinful nature together with its passions and appetites. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, verse, verse 25, if we claim to live by the Holy Spirit, we must also walk by the Spirit with personal integrity, godly character, and moral courage. Our conduct empowered by the Holy Spirit, we must not become conceited, challenging, or provoking one another, envying one another. Wow. Really enjoyed that. Very, very much. I hope hope you did too. Hope you got a lot out of it. Uh, so that's the end of chapter 5. Next time I'll pick up with chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, again, I urge everybody, if you stumbled across this video, it's a part of a series, please watch the entire playlist from the beginning, including the introductory video. Uh, I've been saying that the introductory video is about an hour long, but I noticed yesterday, uh, uh, I looked at it, it's only, it's less than 30 minutes long, but it's very, very important because it lays a foundation so that you'll be actually be able to understand the New Testament. Without, with, with, without the, these insights I'm giving you about how James, Galatians, Acts, Hebrews, how all these Romans, how all these are part of this puzzle. If you don't put it together right and see what's really going on here, you'll, you, you will never really understand the truth of the New Testament. So I hope you will watch it. I hope you will comment too. Thank you for watching. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.